Hello folks, thanks for joining me once again on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel. And today we're going to read Sketch for the History of the Dionysian Artificers A Fragment by Hippolyto or Hippolyto Joseph da Costa Esquire London Sold by Messrs. Sherwood, Neely, and Jones, Paternoster Row, in 1820, price three shillings. And this reading will be longer than your usual readings, and probably will be maybe in two parts. However, I'm getting to that point where most of the books I have left are larger books. The mystery and importance as such as this. The mysteries of the ancients and the associations in which their doctrines were taught have hardly been considered in modern times but with a view to decry and ridicule them. The systems of ancient mythology have been treated as monstrous absurdities debasing the human reason conducting to idolatry and favoring depravity of manners. However, they deserve attention if the motives of their inventors rather than the prolificacy and ignorance of their corruptors be contemplated. When men were deprived of the light of revelation, those who formed systems of morality to guide their fellow creatures according to the dictates of improved reason deserved the thanks of mankind. However deficient those systems might be, or time may have altered them, respect, not derision, ought to attend the efforts of those good men, though their labors might have proved unavailing. In this point of view must be considered in an association traced to the most remote antiquity, and preserved through numberless vicissitudes, yet retaining the original marks of its foundation, scope, and tenets. It appears that at a very early period some contemplative men were desirous of deducting from the observation of nature moral rules for the conduct of mankind. Astronomy was the science selected for this purpose, architecture was afterwards called in aid of this system, and its followers formed a society or sect which will be the object of this inquiry. The continuity or continuity of this system will be found sometimes broken the natural effect of conflicting theories of the alteration of manners and of change of circumstances, but it will make its appearances at different periods, and the same truth will be seen constantly. The importance of calculating with precision the seasons of the year to regulate our agricultural pursuits, navigation, and other necessary avocations in life must be made the science of astronomy an object of great care. In the government of all civilized nations, and the prediction of eclipses and other phenomena must have obtained for the learned in this science such respect and veneration from the ignorant multitude as to render it extremely useful to legislators in framing laws for regulating the moral conduct of their people. The laws of nature and the moral rules deducted from them were explained in allegorical histories, which we call fables, and those allegorical histories were impressed in the memory by symbolical ceremonies denom denominated mysteries, and which, though afterwards misunderstood and misapplied, contain systems of the most profound and most sublime and the most useful theory of philosophy. Among those mysteries are peculiarly remarkable the Eleusinian, the Dionysian, Bacchus, Osiris, Adonis, Tammuz, Apollo, etc., were names adopted in various languages and in several countries to designate the divinity who was the object of those ceremonies, and it is generally admitted that the sun was meant by these several denominations. 
Let us begin with a fact not disputed, that in these ceremonies a death and resurrection was represented, and that the interval between death and resurrection was sometimes three days, sometimes fifteen days. Now, by the concurrent testimony of all ancient authors, the deities called Osiris, Adonis, Bacchus, etc., were names given to, or types, representing the sun, considered in different situations, and contemplated under various points of views. Therefore, these symbolic representations, which describe the sun as dead, that is to say, hidden for three days under the horizon, must have originated in a climate where the sun, when in lower hemisphere, is, at a certain season of the year, concealed for three days from the view of inhabitants. Such climate is, in fact, to be found as far north latitude as 66 degrees. And it is reasonable to conclude that from a people living near the polar circle, the worship of the sun with such ceremonies must have originated, and some have supposed that this these people were the Atlantites. The worship of the sun is generally traced to Mitraic rites and those invented by the Magi of Persia. But if the sun could be made an object of veneration, if the preservation of fire could be thought deserving of religious ceremonies, it is more natural that it should be with a people living in a frozen clime to whom the sun is the greatest comfort, whose absence under the horizon for three days is a deplorable event, and whose appearance above the horizon a real source of joy. Not so in Persia, where the sun is never hidden for three days together under the horizon, and where its piercing rays are so far from being a source of pleasure, that to be screened from them, to enjoy cool shades, is one of those comforts to attain which all the ingenu ingenuity ingenuity of art is exerted. The worship, therefore, of the sun and the keeping sacred fires must have been a foreign introduction into Persia. The conjecture is strengthened by some important facts which, referring to astronomical illusions, place the scene out of Persia, though the theory is found there. In the Bon Dishu, or Dehish, I don't know, Translated by Antio du Pierron, page 400, we find that the longest day of the summer is equal to two shortest of the winter, and that the longest night in the winter is equal to the two shortest nights in the summer. This circumstance can only take place at a latitude of 49 degrees and 20, uh, where the longest day of the year is of 16 hours and 10 minutes and the shortest of 8 hours and 5 minutes. This latitude is far beyond the limits of Persia, where history places Zoroaster, to whom the sacred doctrines of the Persian book Bondesush are attributed. This proportion, then, of days and nights, as general rule, could only be true in Scalia, whether at the sources of the Erdich, the Ovi, the Genesee, or the Slinger. We know nothing of the ancient history of those Scythians or Masagets, Masagets, sorry, Masagates, but we know that they disputed their antiquity with the Egyptians, okay. and that the above principle, though attributed to the Persian Zoroaster, is only applicable to the country of those Scythians. Scythians. But let the origin of Scythians, probably Scythians, but let the origin of the mysteries of the sun begin where it may. They were celebrated in Greece, in various places among others. And at Apollyana, uh, the city dedicated to Apollo, and situated in latitude 41-22, in this latitude the longest day has 15 hours, differing 3 hours from the length of the day when the sun is on the equinoxal,
The reverse is the case with the knights. This circumstance will account for the preservation of three days in these mysteries, even when celebrated in Greece, and also for the fifteen days or representation of the number of fifteen in some of the Illusionian rites. The mysterious numbers were employed to designate such and similar operations of nature, for it is said that the Pythagorean symbols and secrets were borrowed from the Orphic or Illusionian rites, and that they consisted in the study of the sciences and useful arts united with theology and ethics, and were communicated in ciphers and symbols. Similar intimida intim intimations and to the mystic import of the numbers are found in many other authors, by many other authors. The letters representing uh, this, this certain spots are, are, are written terribly, so I may add the here and there. The letters representing numbers formed Kabbalistic names expressive of the essential qualities of those things they meant to represent. And even the Greeks, when they translated foreign names, whose Kabbalistic, uh, Kabbalistic uh, import they knew, so they rendered them by Greek letters, as to preserve the same interpretation in numbers, which we find exemplified in the name Nile. But in the number three, to which so many mystical and moral allusions were made, had a reference to the three celestial circles, two of which the sun touches, passing over the third in its annual course. The mysteries of Eleusis, or Eleusis in the same, is the same as those of Dionysius or Bacchus, were supposed by some to have been introduced into Greece by Orpheus, or Orpheus, and they may have come there from Egypt, but Egypt may have received them at a previous period from the Persians, and these again from the Scythians, and but taking them only as we find them in Greece, we will give here an outline of their ceremonies. The aspirant for these mysteries was not admitted a candidate till he arrived at a certain age. Um, particular persons were appointed to examine and prepare him for the rites of initiation, and those whose conduct was found irregular or who had been guilty of atrocious crimes were rejected. Those found worthy of admittance were then instructed by significant symbols in the principles of society. At the ceremony of admission into these mysteries, the candidate was first shown into a dark room called the mystical chapel. There, certain questions were put to him. When introduced, the holy book was brought forward, and between, from between two pillars or stones, he was rewarded by the vision. A multitude of extraordinary lights were presented to him, some of which were worthy of a particular remark. He stood on a sheepskin. The person opposite was called the revealer of sacred things, and he was also clothed in a sheepskin or with a veil of purple, and on his right shoulder a mule skin spotted or variegated, representing the rays of the sun and stars. At a certain distance stood the torchbearer, who represented the sun, and beside the altar was a third person, who represented the moon. Thus we perceive that over these assemblies presided three persons in different employments, and we may remark that in the government of the caravans in the eastern countries, three persons also directed them, though there were five principal officers besides the three mathematicians, whose three persons are the commander-in-chief, who rules all, the captain of the march, who has the ruling power, as long as the caravan moves, and the captain of the rest, or refreshment, who assumes the government as soon as the caravan stops to refresh. Some authors have observed the same division of power in the march of the Israelites through the wilderness, and consider Moses as the captain general, Joshua as captain of the march, and perhaps Aaron as captain of the rest. 
The society of which we are speaking was ruled by three persons, with different duties assigned to them by a custom of the most remote antiquity. The mysteries, however, were not communicated at once, but by graduations in three different parts. The business of the initiation, properly speaking, was divided into five sections, as we find the in passage of Theo, who compares philosophy to those mystic rites. These ceremonies thus far appear to contain the lesser mysteries, or the first and second stages of the candidate in his progress through the course of his initiations. There was, however, a third stage when the candidate himself was made symbolically to approach death and then return to life. In this re third stage of the ceremony, the candidate was stretched upon the couch to represent his death. As to the festivities in which those mysteries were celebrated, we find that on the 17th of the month Aether, the images of Osiris were enclosed in a coffin or ark. On the 18th was the search, and on the 19th was the finding. The thug and fables or symbolical histories relating to these mysteries we find Adonis slain and resuscitated, and the Syrian women weeping for Thamuz, etc., and company. Let us now examine what was meant by this symbolical death and resurrection, or by certain personages said to have had visited Hades and then returning up again. It appears that this type, in all its various forms and denominations, indicated the sun passing through the lowest her lower hemisphere and coming again to the upper. The Egyptians, who observed this worship of the sun under the name of Osiris, represented the sun in the figure of an old man just before the winter solstice, and typified him as uh, by Seraphis, having the constellation of Leo opposite to him, the serpent or hydra under him, the wolf on the east of the lion, and the dog on the west. This is the state of the southern hemisphere at midnight about that period of year. The same Egyptians represented by the sun by the boy Harpocrates at see that doesn't make any sense. Hippocrates is a Greek name, not an Egyptian name. And okay, but anyway, at the vernal equinox I'm just reading the book, folks. Okay. Um and then was the festivity of the death, burial, and resurrection of Osiris. That is to say, the sun in the lower hemisphere just coming up and rising above the upper hemisphere. In this upper situation, the sun was called Horus, Mithras, etc., and hailed as Sol Invictus. We will now point out some other symbols to express the same phenomena, though different from those types we are treating at, as present, at present. In the Mithraical astronomical monuments, where the figure of a man is represented conquering and killing a bull, there are two figures by their sides with torches, one pointing downwards and the other one upwards. These monuments where the mysteries in question were depicted, the man killing and conquering the bull represent the sun passing to the upper hemisphere through the sign of Taurus, which in that remote period, 4,600 years before our era, was the equinoxal sign. The two torch bearers, the one pointing his torch downwards and the other upwards, represent the sun passing down to the lower hemisphere and coming up again. At the remote time before alluded to, the sun entered the sign Taurus at the summer equinox, and the year was begun at this period among the Egyptian astronomers. Afterwards, in consequence of the procession of the equinoxes, the summer equinox took place in the sign of Aries. Hence, part of the Egyptians transferred their worship from the bull or calf to the ram, while others continued to worship the bull. We may explain this in the language of our modern astronomers by saying that some of the learned Egyptians continued to reckon by the movable zodiac, while others reckoned the year by the fixed zodiac, and this circumstance produced a division of sects in the people, as it was a division of opinion amongst the learned.
Likewise, by the same procession of the equinoxes, the sun passed from Aries to Pisces in the vernal equinox, about 338 years before era, yet the beginning of the year continued to be reckoned from Aries. If the Egyptian astronomy and the Egyptian religion had then existed with the same vigor, both would have perhaps suffered a similar alteration, but the Egyptian systems were at that period nearly annihilated. We may observe, however, that the Christians at the beginning of our era marked their tombs with fishes as an emblem of Christianity to distinguish their sepulchres uh, from those of the heathens by a symbol unknown to them. And of course the fish is Pisces. And returning from this short digression to our immediate purpose, we have to observe that if those ceremonies and symbols were meant to represent the sun, the laws of its notions, these very phenomena of nature were studied with a moral view as being themselves types or arguments to a more sublime or metaphysical philosophy, and the moral rules therefrom deducted were impressed on the memory by those lively images and representations. The emerging of the sun into the lower hemisphere and its returning was contemplated either as a proof or as a symbol of the immortality of the soul, one of the most important as well as the most sublime tenets of the Platonic philosophy. The doctrines of the spirituality and immortality of the soul explained by those symbols were very little understood even by the initiated. Thus we find some of them took those types to signify merely the present body by their descriptions of the infernal abodes, whereas the true meaning of these mysteries inculcated the doctrine of a future state of the soul and the future rewards and punishments, and that such were the doctrines of those philosophers is shown by many and indisputable authorities. The union of the soul with the body was considered as the death of the soul, its separation as the resurrection of the soul, and such ceremonies and types were intended to impress the doctrine of the immersion of the soul into matter as is well attested. By the emblem of the sun descending into the lower hemisphere was also represented the soul of man, who, through ignorance and uncultivation, was in a state compared to sleep, or almost dead, which mystery was intended to stimulate man to the learning of sciences. The Egyptians also considered matter as a species of mud or mire in which the soul was emerged, and in the ancient author or in an ancient author, we find the recapitulation of these theories in the same sense. Now, the Persians, who followed the tents of Zerdaust, called by the Greek, Z Greeks Zoroaster, um, or Zoroaster, uh, some people say, I don't know, having received the same doctrines upon the mystical contemplation of the sun made also the same metaphysical application to the soul of the passage of the sun through the signs of the zodiac. The sun, moreover, was considered as the symbol of the active principle, whereas the moon and earth were symbols of the passive. The sun itself, considering its beneficial influence in the physical world, was chosen as a symbol of the deity, though afterwards taken by the vulgar as the deity as a deity. It must be here particularly observed that different names which the Egyptians from whom the Greeks learned them gave to God instead of meaning several gods were only expressions of the different productive effects of the only one God, not very different from the Jews derived from the great name the Tetragrammaton. <coughs> The fables, allegories, and types of ancients, being of three classes, import sometimes various meanings. Therefore, some of the ceremonies to which sublime import is attached are also applied to typify less dignified operations in the natural system. Thus, for instance, the fable of Proserpine Proserpine or Proserpine, which alludes to the immersion of the soul uh, into the body, 
was also employed to symbolize the operation of the seed in the ground. But the general doctrine of Plato, of the descent of the soul into the darkness, of the body, the pearls of the passions, and the torments and vices appears to be perfectly described by Virgil, though this poet was of the Epicurean sect the most fashionable in his days. The lesser mysteries represented, as we have seen, the descent of the soul into the body and the pains therein suffered. The greater mysteries were intended to typify the splendid visions or the happy state of the soul, both here and hereafter, when purified from the defilements of material nature. These doctrines are also inculcated by the fables of the fortunate islands, the Elysian fields, etc. The different purifications in these rites were symbols of the gradation of virtues necessary to the reascent of the soul. Now, inward purity... <clears throat> of which external purifications were symbols, can only be attained by the exercise of these virtues. To the illusion of these virtues must be understood what Socrates says, that it is the business of philosophers to study, to die, and to be themselves death, and as at the same time he reprobates suicide, such death cannot mean any other but philosophical death or the exercise of what he calls the cathartic virtues. If such was the meaning and import of the Eleusinian and Dionysian rites, symbols, and ceremonies, it must be allowed that a society or sect which was employed in the contemplation of such sublime truths cannot be looked upon as trifling or profligate. The very Christian fathers who so strongly attacked the pagan religion confess the utility of these symbols and that the circumstances previous to the initiation into those mysteries tended to exclude impious notions and prepare the mind to hear the truth. Those mysteries were concealed from the vulgar because it would be a ridiculous prostitution of such sublime theories to disclose them to the multitude incapable of understanding them, when even many of the initiates for what of study and application did not comprehend the whole meaning of the symbols. They study for years and years and years years. And the multitude were told only in the abstract the doctrine of the future state of rewards and punishments and were made acquitted with the calendar and the result of astronomical observations, the knowledge of which was connected with their festivities and agricultural pursuits. They were likewise taught other practicable parts of science calculated for general use. The secrecy of these mysteries was the first cause of obloquy against them, and next came beyond doubt the depravity of their fellow followers and the perversion of those assemblies in the convivial meetings first and then into the most debauched association or debauched associations. Secrecy also was enjoined by the laws. It was death to reveal anything belonging to the Eleusinian mysteries. To disclose imprudently anything about them was supposed, even in Phicorus. Of this we find a very conspicuous instance in Plutarch. Out of respect for this custom, the scholars were, in general, only instructed in the exoteric doctrines, the acromatic doctrines were taught only to the few select by private communication and viva voce. Now, I think I was supposed to say but, but when the ignorance of, the, it says rut, but I think it's supposed to say but, when the ignorance of the very teachers of those mysteries caused their 
forms only to be attended to, the essence was lost, and the shadow only remained. And then even those forms and ceremonies were frequented by persons ignorant of their import and wicked enough to turn them into their private interests, as a machine employed in deceiving the people, and to occasions of debauchery and depravity. We shall give an example of this. The mysteries of Eleusis, or the sun, were united, or analogous, to those of Dionysius, uh, or Bacchus, because according to the Orphic theology, the intellect of every planet was denom denominated Bacchus, and so when the sun was considered as a spiritual intelligence, who moved or caused this planet to move in its annual circle, he was denominated Tritiritis of Bacchus, mainly it means tri Bacchus, as in three again. So the, the, the ceremonies, therefore, of Bacchus were attended with rejoicings as the triumph of the spirit over matter. But this circumstance so intimately connected with the sublime notions of the Illusionian mysteries was completely turned into a mere banqueting and processions of drunken people who of, of the ceremonies knew nothing else than to carry branches of trees in their hands. Sounds like modern day Freemasons. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, more still, a depraved priest introduced those the Bacchanalian mysteries into Rome for the very worst of purposes, which, alarming the Senate, the most severe punishment was inflicted on him and his followers. In consequence of those abuses, it was that Socrates refused to be initiated, and the same did Diogenes, or Diogenes and uh, alleging that uh, Pataeusion, a notorious robber, had obtained initiation. Uh, Epimedon, Epimedonus, Epimedonus, sorry. Oh boy, I'm glad I live nowadays, not back then. Names were pain. I hate names, reading the Bible too, man, it sucks. Anyway, also in the Ezekiel's never desired it. Okay, whoever those guys were. But if those who were desirous of being Lysicius clothed themselves with those mysteries. This had nothing to do with the original tenets of the institution, for the purity of its votaries was carried according to the primitive mysteries to the most delicate and scrupulous point. After such respectable authorities, as we have referred to, we must reject as impudent calumnies, 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 the assert what is an impudent calumny? I've never heard of this word you know. Wow, man. The assertion of Tertullian, who says that the natural parts of man were enclosed in the ark and carried about in the processions of those mysteries. Theodora and Arnobius say they were the parts of a woman. Such asserters had no means of ascertaining what was not known to anyone out of the precincts of those most recondite mysteries. We should rather guess that in the dark carried in the procession and said to enclose in the body of Osiris, fears, spears were deposited representing our solar system. In regard to these accusations found in some of the ecclesiastical writers, we must also observe that many of them, led by a mistaken zeal for the Christian religion, disfigured in the most reprehensible degree the ancient historical monuments, taking, for instance, the manner in which the history of Egypt was written by Menthion, a Manathon, was transmitted to us by those ecclesiastical writers. Others of such writers, in fact, knew nothing of the Egyptian mysteries. The conclusion, therefore, is that the motives of these institutions were good and pure as tending to the study of science and practice of morality, though the same institutions afterwards degenerated. 
and their degeneration was followed by the ruin of the state as predicted by Trismegistus himself, who in this prediction tr proved how great a philosopher and politician he was. And having thus established what was the meaning and import of the Illusionian or Dionysian mysteries among the ancient Greeks, who transmitted to us the knowledge of them, and having shown that the ceremonies were not intended in their origin as a worship of the sun, considered as a deity, we shall proceed to examine how those mysteries were communicated to other nations by the Greeks. About fifty years before the building of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, a colony of Grecians, chiefly Ionians, complaining of the narrow limits of their country in an increased population, immigrated, and having been settled in Asia Minor, gave to that country the name of Ionia. No doubt the people carried within them their manners, sciences, and religion. And the mysteries of Eleusis, among the rest, accordingly, we find that one of their cities, Bablos, was famed for the worship of Apollo. And the Apollonia, the Apollonia had been with their ancestors. These Ionians, participating in the proof state of civilization in which their mother country, Greece, was then was cultivated in the sciences and useful arts, but made themselves most conspicuous in architecture and invented or improved the order called by their own name Ionian. These Ionians formed a society whose purpose was to employ themselves in erecting buildings, the general assembly of the society, and the, was first held at Theos, but afterwards, in consequence of some civil commotions, passed to Libidos. Now this sect or society was now called the Dionysian artificers, and as Bacchus was supposed to be the inventor of building theaters, and they performed the Dionysian festivities, they afterwards extended themselves to Syria, Persia, and India. From this period the science of astronomy, which had given rise to the symbols of the Dionysian rites, Dionysian rites, became connected with types taken from the art of building. These Ionian Ionian societies divided themselves into different sections or minor assemblies. Some of those small or dependent associations had also their distinguishing names, but they extended their moral views in conjunction with the art of building to many useful purposes and to the practice of the acts of benevolence. We find recorded that these societies and their utility were many years afterwards inquired into by Cambyses, king of Persis, Cambyses, and uh, who approved of them and gave to them great marks of favor. In uh, it is essential to observe that these societies had significant words to distinguish their members, and for the same purpose they used emblems taken from the art of building. Now let us uh, notice the passage of the Dionysian artificers to Judea. Solomon attained from Hiram, Abith, the king of Tyre, men skillful in the art of building, when the temple was erected at Jerusalem. Now among the foreigners who came on this occasion, we find men from Gabal and Gibbalim, and that is to say the Ionians settled in Asia Minor for Gabal or Byblos, and was that city where stood the temple of Apollo, where the Eleusinian rites or Dionysian mysteries were celebrated, as we have already stated. We could, in addition to this argument, produce some authority for Josephus, says that the Grecian style of architecture was used at the temple of Jerusalem. After this, we cannot be surprised to find the ceremonies of Eleusis or Thamuz should be uh, introduced into Judea, particularly as Solomon himself, after having entered into the scientific illusions in the construction of the temple, was not free from the accusation of the gross superstition of idolatry. Now, so we find some years afterwards that the prophet Ezekiel complaining that the Israelitish women were weeping for Thamuz at a certain period of the year at the very gates of the temple. But it is 
natural to suppose that the Dionysian artificers would not have attempted to introduce those rites among the religious Jews as a mere matter of idolatry for the worship of the sun. The ideas of the Israelites concerning the unity of God would have revolted at anything inducing the belief of the polytheism of the Gentiles. The symbol, therefore, in these mysteries must have been explained to the Jews to mean only the sun in the true and original sense of those mysteries, that is to say, as an emblem of God's goodness to man, and the apparent motions of that luminary, first as the guide for fixing the seasons, next as types or remembrances of the immortality of the soul, for this dogma does not appear either clear in the books of the Jews before that period, or universally admitted amongst them at a much later date. To avoid, therefore, any allusion to idolatry in these ceremonies and symbols, another personage or another name must have been substituted for Adonis or Osiris, and as a symbolical death and resurrection was essential, in the allegory of the system, the history of the death of another individual must have been substituted. However, in framing this new symbolical history, the first circumstances were to be related connected with the death of that personage, as to typify and account for the whole of the Illusionian mysteries, or the passage of the sun from the upper to lower hemisphere and its returning up again. In the formation of this new system, or rather new allegory to the same system, though the name of the hero was changed, the circumstances must have persevered as far as consistent with new names. The whole fabric of the temple would favor the, an illusion of this sort. The foundation stone was laid on the second day of the second month, which corresponds on an average to the 20th of April, reckoning the sacred year upon the fixed zodiac. Okay. It's helping people kind of, you know, some of this stuff, it'll click with you, and you'll, and you'll get it. You'll see where it fits right in to every, everything else. If, you, if you've stuck with me this long, I know I, I kind of hit a rough spot there on the reading because it's late, I'm tired, this is long, and, uh, you know, <laughs> so, but uh, we're going to stop right here at the fixed zodiac. Bam. Okay, and we'll pick up at the part two uh, right here on this line here. And uh, so I thank you for joining me for part one. And uh, hopefully it's not too long. I'll try not to put you to sleep. No, it's, it's really important stuff to understand. If you're, especially if you're into uh, learning about uh, how they do things with the numerology and uh, the certain dates and the importance of 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 that, of the timing, of the of the things they do. All right. Anyway, that's just one aspect of it.